before we get started, I'll introduce uh, our first round of adult panelists. Most of the bios are in the program, so unfortunately I've um, slightly butchered your biographies. I'm just going to give a real quick kind of one line on who they are. Um, so firstly, we have Guy, who is the founder of Riverford Organic Farm and a self-confessed veg nerd. Uh, we have Charlie Clutterbuck, who has three degrees in agricultural sciences and established the first food and politics group in the UK, recently published a book called The Bittersweet Brexit, The Future of Food, Farming, Land and Labour. A lot of price, mate. <laughs> We've got Susie Russell, who is a program manager for uh, the Community Supported Agriculture Network, the CSA Network. And we've got Imogen Richmond Bishop, who has spent three years coordinating the Right to Food program for Sustain, uh, and is the research advocacy and comms manager for the social rights charity Just Fair. And then last but not least, we have Henry Dimbleby, who is uh, the founder of Leon and co-authored the School Food Plan and co-founded the Sustainable Restaurant Association. He is obviously, as many of you know, leading the work around the national food strategy. And before we get stuck in with questions, I just wanted to ask him to very briefly just touch on what the national food strategy is. In two minutes, I have the food strategy. Our current food system does a lot of amazing things. It's... Uh, creates, uh, uh, it delivers an amazing array of food that would be unimaginable to previous generations. A lot of pleasure, a lot of jobs. Um, it's an extraordinary complex tapestry of interconnected activities. But we increasingly understand that it is, um, it has uh, destroyed our environment, uh, it creates a lot of carbon, and it's making us sick. And a strategy is uh, intended to set out why those problems have come about and try to uh, set out the actions that government and citizens and businesses and civil society need to take to pivot from the food system we have today that, to a food system that the next generation can be proud of. Perfect. Thanks very much. So, we'll get stuck in with the questions. Um, our first question is going to come from Shanti. Um, Shanti has been involved in permaculture from a very young age and completed a permaculture design certificate course at Applewood Permaculture Centre in June. And she's participated in the permaculture exchanges in Europe and is currently studying contemporary circus and physical theatre in Bristol. Shanti, would you like to read out your question? We're currently in the midst of climate chaos with very few tangible actions from our governing bodies and or large agricultural industries. What are the large scale actions that can be taken to build resilience within our food system? Henry, is it okay if you take that one? Sure. I mean, I think it is unbelievably difficult to work out how to do it, but if you were to wave a magic wand, the one thing that you could do would be to create a carbon border tax. And the reason that that is useful is because if you have a tax whereby you charge uh, other countries for the carbon in their produce, if they have um, grown that food to lower carbon standards than we have in this country, not only do you get our house uh, in order, but quite quickly other governments rather than letting us take that money, we want to take it themselves. And it would, it's the one way in which rich Western countries can try and create a carbon economy that forces the reduction of carbon not only here but abroad. But politically, it is fraught with, uh, fraught with difficulty. It would be very hard to introduce. Thank you. Shanti, do you feel like that answered your question? Do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, thank you. Cool, great. So, uh, next up, we have Jaden. Can Jayden. I ask for clarification of that? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> sure. You, I haven't got a mic for you, but... You. Sorry, Henry. Was, was that a carbon border tax? Did I hear you right? Yes. It just sounds just unbelievably ludicrous and hopeless to me, but I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so I would just be, uh, you know, I'd just like to hear how have some indication of how that might work. I mean, it implies to me that everyone everywhere in the globe is going to be able to measure the carbon impact of their agriculture. How on earth is that going to happen? So, 
the, 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 the people who are um, uh, more intelligent than me, all, although no doubt no less ludicrous, uh, who are thinking about this, the way in which they're constructing it is that you start with um, the most carbon intensive thing. So you do not try and measure the carbon on every Mange 2 or pumpkin. You start with um, steel, you start with the, ver the, the big import industries, and you would create that tax on, uh, on carbon, on the highest carbon uh, creating things. I think, sorry, I was asked for, like, if you wanted to do one big thing. I think it's very, very difficult practically, politically to do, but I think if you were to, to if you had uh, agreement between nations, it is the best way that you could force a uh, reduction in carbon in other countries. Sorry, could another viable option just be to encourage sourcing things more locally as well? Yes, Yes. Very briefly and then... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly the answer I would give. If you look at our greenhouse gas emissions relating to food and farming, something like two-thirds of the, the gas is produced abroad and we use 70% of the land used to produce our food is abroad. So I think the best thing we could do as a nation to contribute to reduced emissions is to produce much more food in this country and I don't mean just a little bit, I mean getting up towards 80-90% of our food instead of 50% uh, and I can come back on that as a... An it, might come, it might come up again as we progress. Say. Anything else to add? Great. Fantastic. So. Moving on, our next question is from Jaden. Jaden is an 18-year-old, home-educated, black young man from London. He has a weekend job at a Creole vegan bakery and volunteers at a community food growing garden. He has also volunteered at award-winning project Timbaku in Aradu Pradesh, India, where he helped build a garden for the school and worked on the organic farm. He aspires to be a farmer and baker slash chef. Jaden, what's your question? So my question is, I visited India, eh, the Timbuktu Collective in Andhra Pradesh, India, a couple of years ago. And not only was the organic food very much available for everyone locally, whether they didn't have big incomes or were disabled, but everyone was able to participate in local food systems and societies with dignity. How will the national food strategy put people and equality at its heart? Pass this one over. What, Imogen, do you think you might be able to touch on that one? How should we? How should they? Well, yeah, I mean, interestingly, India is one of the countries in the world that has got right to food legislation, so I think that's quite a key step that they've taken. Um, and obviously, you can't exactly compare two nations, and I think in the UK, as we all know, there's a lot of inequality in terms of food access, especially around organic food. Um, and I think, yeah, it, you know, things need to change. They have to change. So we don't really have a choice. We shouldn't be looking at just the problems. We need to go, right, what are the solutions? We need to just sort of recognize that all of us need to eat. We all need to eat with dignity and with respect. We're all humans. Um, and therefore, the food system needs to be able to provide that food that is good, that is healthy, that is produced in a way that supports our farmers, supports our communities, and that's what I think the food strategy should be looking at. But I don't want to take too much time because I want to... Sure. Oh, 58 seconds. 58 seconds. Oh. Um, <laughs> feel, feel free. I, I just wanted to maybe, if you want to come back, have a bit more of a dialogue rather than just me, because I can talk for hours. <laughs> 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 Henry, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? About how, how will the food strategy ensure that um, people and equality is kind of at its core? Um, it, it is one of the most difficult of all of the things that you have to tackle, which is particularly in this country, our food system has moved further away from the, 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 the severance because of the Industrial Revolution is greater than in most European countries. And in fact, in, I, went, I went to see Birmingham. Birmingham are actually twinning with uh, a city in India to learn from them about how they can recreate that connection. So I have no idea how you do it, but it is definitely something that we need to work out uh, if we're going to improve the food system in this country. 
I hey. just also wanted to touch in on a quick thing. I think one of the, so I work mainly on food poverty rather than food production, and one of the things that we see is the reason that people can't afford food. It's not that they don't want to buy nice food, they don't want to get the organic food, they don't want to support farms, it's because they can't afford to. Wages have gone, you know, living standards are stagnating, a lot of people are working full time yet can't afford to pay their rent, pay their bills. You know, you see food banks going up, and not just food banks, you know, there's food aid as well in other forms, and there's also welfare payments that just aren't covering living costs. So I think that's another thing you need to tackle. So it's not just the food system, it's also wages and welfare. And can I just... Yeah. <laughs> Five seconds, go. Just say it's inequality in the food production system as well. Let's not forget that, that some of the worst wages in the country are in the food system, in the fields, in the cafes, in the pack houses, in the warehouses, because we all want cheap, cheap food. We, if we're going to turn the system around, we've got to pay better and find a way of paying people better so that there's careers on the land instead of exploitation and modern slavery, that, in a nutshell. That's inequality as well. So you know, people at the top will be getting a lot of money, people at the bottom won't, and it's, it needs to be better redistributed. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. That's okay. So that's keep keep hold of the mic over there. You can pass it between yourselves. Uh, thank you. Um, next up, we have Sam. So Sam recently graduated from the University of Nottingham uh, in psychology and uh, has an MA in mental health research. And during his studies, the majority of Sam's time was spent working on startup social enterprises aimed at tackling the food poverty crisis. So beginning with a social supermarket redistributing surplus produce, he has shifted his focus within the supply chain to local food production, which is crucial for ecological sustainability, but also important for improving mental health and well-being. Sam, what's your question? Uh, hi guys, yes, yeah, so I'm interested in how the food strategy can be used to encourage the investment in the infrastructure we need to support local food production, so particularly in the support of food transportation and also the sale of food, so like local markets and that sort of stuff. And Susie, are you okay to answer that? Yeah, so I'm from the Community Supported Agriculture Network, so we support um, mostly small farms who have community investment, and because the, com because the community invest in them, it means that the farmers are getting a, a decent wage and it's a viable business. So I guess, I mean, one of the biggest things is access to land, so encouraging, like, um, county farms, bringing back county farms, supporting, encouraging local authorities to give... Um, land to, and support growers and support kind of growing schemes so that people with no capital can start growing and CSA is great you can start all you need is a farmer to rent your bit of land loads of energy and enthusiasm and a, and a way to encourage some of your local community to buy your boxes and you're away so it is a brilliant way for new entrants to get involved in farming I don't know if that yeah. answers your question so, yeah, does big time. just also any, any points on the actual transport of food as well I know that's a big cost is the, just the added food miles of moving it just from point A to B so any infrastructure we'd need for the transport again one of the great things about CSA is that it's local so our vision would be for a CSA in every neighbourhood because then you, you start cutting out all of that transport um, but things like electric cargo bikes and that kind of stuff will, would help as well with with that because yeah the transport is one of the biggest kind of carbon problems with food Break. It just um, on local food hubs and distribution and shortened mileage we, we're basically just talking about it and relying on bits of voluntary funding at the moment what is I was amazed at I was looking at American subsidies the other week and realized that they subsidize more than European just about to 20 billion pounds more but something like three quarters of that goes to food stamps and you think what's and you th and what that means is people are given money to spend at the local supermarkets they have a card and they can spend it and buy local food the local farmers love it as well because they can produce into the towns and suddenly they've got a lot of money to do that with we haven't got anything like that we're still thinking about it and i thought the potential of that is enormous and rather food stamps rather than food banks which are like the waste product of the whole system, aren't they? The crap food goes in the, at the end instead of starting off with the farmers and local food. Yeah, uh, two suggestions for Henry. Um, one is supermarkets as a condition of planning permission, you oblige them to provide perhaps two parking spaces for local producers to sell their own produce in. Uh, and the second one is, you're right, transport is a major thing for small producers, but packaging is as, as well. Single-use packaging, particularly in fruit and vegetables. I would love to see the, a scheme of returnable fold-down 
plastic boxes which everyone could use, every farmer in the country, that probably would be deposit carrying and that would solve that problem as well. It's something that's never going to be solved by private enterprise. It needs a government initiative to get it started. Thanks, Guy. I think I would also just add, as someone who helps organise a market, that to my knowledge there is zero support or investment or infrastructure for people running farmers markets or wanting to establish farmers markets. And in in the area that I'm in, we've seen most of the local farmers markets disappear. Ours is one of the last remaining. Um, and I've I've been contacted by so many people saying that their farmers market somewhere else in the UK is is struggling. And I do think that it's it's a kind of something that is quite under the radar and people aren't aware that, you know, other than the kind of bougie inner city London markets, ours is in the middle of the countryside and um, I think markets like that are becoming increasingly rare but are a really important lifeline to small producers in my experience. What so the most useful form of help, the most useful way in which... I would, I would... Oh. oh sorry, I was saying what, was the, what would be the most useful way in which the government could have? Is it just money or is there other things that you need? Support networks, I think. There used to be localised groups of markets that don't exist anymore and um, capacity, organising a market takes a lot of time and energy and finding a premises and being able to pay the rent for that premises if that is the way your market operates. Um, being able to have a network of people to tap into that were allies in that would be massively helpful as obviously would some kind of investment or funding. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? Yeah? Great, thank you. So next up we have Freya. Um, Freya. Freya is 15 and currently attends Oxford Spires Academy. Um, they hope to work in theatre or education in the future, but also continue with their activism. They joined Extinction Rebellion in April 2019 after hearing it spoken about at the youth strike in Oxford. Freya went to London for the April and October rebellions and has participated in some of the actions that have taken place in Oxford. In the future, they hope people's attitudes towards personal change in aid of the climate crisis will develop, especially with regard to eating habits and food security. Freya, your question. Um, so, who benefits most from our current food system, who doesn't, and how can a new food strategy ensure, ensure that small-scale producers and local businesses benefit more? This one's for you, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd keep quiet. <laughs> um, I, who benefits most? Clearly, the, the food multinationals and manufacturers, they're pretty obvious. But the ones which who crept into the scene in the last 20 odd years, uh, the food speculators on, on the markets. That uh, tw th There used to be something called forward planning, where you could, farmers in the system could forward buy, forward sell rather, they'd get a guaranteed price. In it. But what happened in the 90s was Clinton and various others said, this system's got to be opened up so that anybody can invest, i.e. gamble on the food market. and. Part of the crisis of 2008, 2009, while it was it started in mortgages and the debts on mortgages, was then the speculators moved out of mortgages and started buying, speculating on food. Food prices shot up in Middle East, Asia, in this country, prices started going, everybody started talking about, you know, um, food shortages, but actually it was manufactured in a way and it soon came back. But if you could put the Asian uprisings down to the price of food at that time going up. If you remember, it was a vegetable grower that set light to himself, um, that set the whole thing off. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of people making a lot of money about gambling on food. Large scale landowners. Oh yeah, yeah. they've always been. <laughs> They're not you, are they? <laughs> Freya, is there anything you wanted to add or challenge um, on? No, that? that's, that's um, I was wondering about like, what can the new strategy, the new food strategy, do to like ensure that it's better for small-scale producers? Modulation of pay payments, whatever we have that comes after um, the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, can we? I mean, Britain has resisted any any capping of payments. I think the rest of Europe has been pretty much in favour of it, actually, and we fought tooth and nail against it. Presumably, this is the lobbying of large landowners, um, you know, it is totally inequitous for, you know, public funds to be going, you know, millions and millions of pounds to some of the richest people in the country to destroy our environment and produce crap food. I concur, yeah. <laughs>
And I said in an article in the Land Worker about a year ago, I said the landowners are getting paid for doing nothing. The Duke of Westminster's manager contacted me and said, this is very unfair criticism of my, my landed uh, boss. He said, we do do things. Um, but I said, well, I'll take you up on it. And uh, we can have an argument at the Inn at Whitewell, which is in Lancashire, which is the, where the Duke of Westminster hangs out. Um, he never took me up on it for some reason. <laughs> but yes, we have got to do away with that. Thanks very much. Um, anything to add? Yeah, cool. Great. So next up we have Alex. Um, Alex is a 17-year-old Oxford youth activist working with the youth climate strikes and occasionally with the local Extinction Rebellion youth group, who is currently in the lower sixth at Cherwell School studying maths, philosophy, ethics, sociology, and history. Alex would like to study PPE at Oxford and use their experience and privileged platform to make some changes in the world. Alex comes from an agricultural background and appreciates the importance of sustainability and farming methods that work with our ecosystem. Alex, would you like to read your question? Uh, how do you think that people's food choices can be encouraged to embrace more seasonal and local produce rather than excessive imports? And that question's for Guy in the first yeah, right. instance. <laughs> Should have seen um, that one coming. Yeah. Well, we are all hypocrites, and me included. I mean, your most die-hard localist, you've opened their fridge in January, I guarantee that 99% of them will be full of uh, Spanish tomatoes. So we've got to view it in that context. How do you encourage people to eat more seasonally? I'm afraid you do have to make it as easy as possible. Uh, you know, so recipes, quick recipes, um, good way to go. But, you know, I think we could, uh, should aspire to do eat in terms of fruit and veg, certainly vegetables anyway, let's say 90% UK grown, I think is achievable without anyone suffering greatly, you know, in terms of their, their food choices and, 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 you know, trying to get people cooking more is, is pretty, pretty key to that, um, whether it's in schools or, but, you know, education around food is obviously vital. And, yeah, and just, um, Supporting people to understand what is seasonal, because I think one of the problems is also that people don't know what's seasonal and what isn't. Everything's just presented. It's, it's rare. That it doesn't say in the supermarket when you go and look at the veg, this is seasonal and this isn't. It just says this is a sprout, and it might say it comes from the UK. Probably yeah. says it comes from Holland. Guy, very kindly, about five years ago now, um, agreed to send, uh, I paid him for it, but to send a veg box that was only English ingredients and we lived for a year 100% uh, only eating vegetables from Riverford Farm that were seasonal. And it was a really interesting experiment in that it, as you went into each season, you, like when you were coming into the kind of pumpkin and um, brassica season, you went through a period of not wanting to look another one of them in the eye, but then you actually moved through that to kind of, to the challenge, the a really enjoyable creative challenge uh, of, of what do I make tonight? But it is, it requires a commitment and a level of education in terms of cookery that is something that's going to be really difficult. I mean, you've been trying to do it, but presumably you, even you, you, the fact that I had to ask you to do a special thing to sell me a new <laughs> English veg suggests it's pretty tricky to do. Uh, we have tried several times to do a UK only box and uh, it never got above 1% of sales and we gave up and then we, I think it was about two years ago we tried again and it is, it, it, we're up to I think maybe 4% now which may seem pathetic but it's a hell of a lot more than 1% and I think it does reflect a kind of some sort of renewed determination of people to, to um, eat seasonally so I'm actually quite heartened by it. Um. So I actually grew up in France, as it turns out, and in French schools you are served mainly seasonal food, so 50% of all food that's procured by the French state has to be either local, which means it you know, be seasonal presumably, or it has to be organic. And so that means that you go through the seasons as a child from a very young age, and it just means you're more used to seeing the more unusual vegetables that you might not see on a school meal plate here. And I think that's something the state has to sort of take responsibility in making it easier for people. Yeah, just to add, we, there was somebody this morning saying that if your mother eats brassicas, so cabbages and sprouts and kale, when you're in her womb, you're going to like brassicas, and if she doesn't, you're not going to like them. So. Hmm. Alex, did you want to add anything or come back on that? I mean, 
sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we I mean, sadly, it, you would hope that you locally grown vegetables would be cheaper, but I'm afraid it's just not the case. I mean, you can buy Spanish broccoli uh, on the wholesale market for about a euro a kilo. Um, English grown purple sprang broccoli would be three euros. You know, and, and that is a reflection, well, actually, it's a reflection of picking speed, actually, but there are lots of reasons why it is, uh, uh, why it is you know, cheaper too often to, 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 to buy imported stuff. And, and it, it's normally because the externalities, the, the costs of those imported produce, you know, the transport, the carbon emissions, the water usage, uh, you know, are not paid for by the farmer, they're borne by society at large. Were those externalities internalised, I think that would help us a lot to, uh, you know, to eat more seasonally. I, I think just as a note of optimism in... But that would probably be even harder to achieve than a carbon border tax, I suspect. <laughs> Just as a note of optimism in respect to what you were saying, I think um, we've definitely experienced it at our market that in the last year and possibly a year and a half, we have seen a, a pickup in particularly younger families and, and people coming to the market for the first time, which I think has been really heartening for lots of our producers, so, especially in the cold, quiet winter months. Um, okay, fantastic. So uh, next up, we have Braden. Braden is a 15-year-old activist. He is in year 11 at Wood Green School in Whitney, Oxfordshire, and especially interested in science, maths, and ethics. In the future, Braden aspires to be able to spend some time primarily doing activism. He lived on a farm for two years as a child and is passionate about making agriculture more sustainable, transitioning to a plant-based food system, and healthy food being affordable and accessible. He's also locally part of Extinction Rebellion and the Oxford Vegan Action and Amnesty Movement. Braden, what's your question? Um, how can we as consumers ensure that the food we purchase is sourced from companies who pay all workers a living wage rather than companies who distribute income unfairly between people in positions of corporate power and various stages of the supply chain? This question is open to anyone who wants to give it a go. Just got a kick. Of the, oh, we are an employee-owned um, company, so more or less everyone decides what we're all going to get paid. One of them used to work for Amazon, and uh, I was working with, beside him on one of the packing lines just before Christmas, and uh, Amazon pay, uh, from what I could work out, somewhere between 80 and 90 pence per drop. Amazon are now moving into, into fresh food. Uh, to self-employed drivers, Amazon pay very little tax. Their drivers will be paying very little tax. They're all self-employed. They have absolutely no protection whatsoever. I mean, the... You know, we have to have a tax regime in this country that, that, that starts to get some revenue out of these companies that are just ripping us all off, quite frankly. I mean, you know, Amazon is benefiting from police, you know, making sure that their drivers aren't robbed. It's basically from the road, from the education that we have, and it's paying bugger all back. And until we start taxing some of those people properly, it's just penalising the companies that actually do pay people properly and driving us out of business, actually. You know, it is, you know I do feel very, very upset about it. I think bringing it back to the question... Sorry, it's, uh, they pay 80 or 90p, it costs us three to four pounds, so what chance have we got? Yeah. Mm. I think bringing it back to the question, uh, is there anything else anyone wants to add on how we as consumers can kind of be better informed or, or anything that we should be doing to help consumers be better informed? Well, you know, the, the question was really was how... How can you buy to ensure that the workers in that company are getting mm. a decent rate of pay? You can think of schemes, but as soon as you start saying red tractor or fair leap or leap or whatever, you realise it falls apart because the actual inspection of the standards is very hard to enforce. And you can't help but, well, I know in the Gangmasters Licensing Act, you know, they, they look after the first tier quite well, but what's going on, you know, of the contractors contracting out, you know, it's just going on and nobody's got any control over it whatsoever. I mean, if you go into the vegetable fields of this country, you will not hear English spoken. Not that I give a monkeys about that in itself, but the, the um, you know, it is all foreign, you know, people being paid absolute, you know, the minimum wage doing work which, you know, mostly UK people would not want to do. You know, they should be paid a damn sight more, they should be earning 10, 12, 15 
£1,000 an hour for the work they're doing. It is very, very hard work. Uh, and, and the only way, you know, that is going to happen is, you know, if we, I'm afraid we are going to have to pay more for our food. Okay. Yeah, can, can I just add the two things? One is that, uh, as you say, let's say the migrant workers in the fields, very hard to organise. And in my union, we set out to try and organise. And it, that in itself is very, very difficult. But just to give you one story, we did recruit about 150 people at a place uh, that has lots of glass houses in Kent, which some of you will know the name of. When we got the 150, we went to the managers and said, right, we, can we, nego we want to negotiate you, we want to recognise union. And they hummed and hard, and they, and they said, well, what's the main problem? They said, well, actually, it's, it's leave. You know, they don't, get any, they don't get two weeks annual leave, and that's, that's a law in this country. So they said, oh, all right, then you know, we'll go along. And the, the, the people went off on holiday, and guess what? When they came back, no job. That's what you're up against. Mm. Just uh, again, from a community support agriculture point of view, if you're buying from your local CSA scheme, if there is one, then you probably know the people that are working there. So, um, yeah, supporting local growing by in your community by local people is a, is a good way to support living wage. Oh, and by the way, the Agricultural Wages Board was abolished five years ago. That did guarantee a fair wage for most farm workers and sick pay and holiday leave, but the coalition government abolished it in 2013, basically at the request of the people that owned the plantations in the east of the country with the migrant workers. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the interest of time, um, we are going to uh, move on to our second panel of speakers. So can we uh, say a big thank you to our first? Henry, if you can stay there, you're, you're going to get two rounds. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, just in the transition, um, I wanted to invite um, Jeremy Isles, uh, who is with us, to um, just briefly touch on the role that urban agriculture um, should be playing in the, in the new food strategy. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank, you. On, yeah. um, thank you for inviting me. Very impressed to have so many articulate and educated young people oh, you putting us to task. Um, my function at the moment, after 16 years of the Federation of City Farms, is I'm independent and I'm heading up a new urban agriculture consortium. We haven't yet had a meeting with DEFRA, oh, but we will be soon. Um, my view is that all these young people, then, all of us, need the opportunity then. to learn to grow food, okay. to have decent food on our tables, and actually to have food that's grown around the corner from us. Over the years, allotments have been under stress in all of our towns and cities, but we've done some, gone some way towards restoring that through the Allotments Regeneration Initiative a few years ago. But my vision now is not only do we need more land in and around cities for community gardens and allotments, we need more land for community enterprises growing food at scale. We need local authority policies and plans in place that will facilitate that as opposed to blocking it. We need people who understand the connectivity between the public good and healthy, nutritious food grown on our doorstep. So that may not solve our global supply, of course it won't, but if Bristol can put in its one city plan that we're going to have 15% of fruit and vegetables grown in and around the city by 2035, hopefully by 2030, then so can every other city in the country. And if DEFRA and the Scottish Government and the Northern Ireland Assembly, because just remember it's not just DEFRA, if DEFRA can open its doors and say to people like me, yeah, come and have a meeting, I haven't got any vested interests, I'm just me, I've got an allotment, by the way, I've had it for 20 years, so if I, I'd be very open to come and have a meeting with people in DEFRA to talk about that, bring some of these young people with us, Create the opportunities, from my perspective, too much of our policy and planning, not only is it in the hands of the vested interests and multinationals, but it's also bound up in policies that take decades to change. So if you talk about Bristol, where I live, the policies are still destroying grade one agricultural land to build sheds and to build park and rides and to build more roads, which we definitely don't need. If we can change those policies so that they are into public good, so that every town and city in this country becomes a growing town and city. And I don't mean in terms of economics, I mean in terms of good, healthy, nutritious food. So Urban Agriculture Consortium is on its way. You can do your bit to help. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Cheers. 
So, uh, just to give you a brief intro, again, the um, everyone's speakers are in the programme, so I'll just give you a very quick um, one-liner on who we've been joined by. So, Henry's now been joined by Sue Pritchard, who is an organic livestock farmer from Wales, a researcher and writer on complex social systems, and the director of the RSA's Food Farming and Countryside Commission. We've got Angela Raffle, who is involved in the Bristol Food and Farming Movement, who chairs the management committee of the Community Farm in the Chew Valley and is involved in public health with an ecological lens. We have Anna Kira, who is a zoologist with a master's in biodiversity conservation and who now manages the food citizenship program for the Food Ethics Council. And then finally, last but not least, we have Kay, who is the director and founder of The Larder, which is a social enterprise and workers' cooperative that runs a cafe, food training academy, and local food procurement enterprise. Thank you for joining us. Um, so without further ado, we'll get stuck in with our second round of questions. So first up, we have Xanthi. Xanthi is a 15-year-old who attends Oxford Spires Academy and is in year 11. After finishing school, she would like to take a gap year and work with Extinction Rebellion youth alongside a part-time job before going to university. Xanthi began her climate activism on the 15th of February 2019 when she went along to her first UK SCN climate strike in Bond Square and has been involved with XR since shortly after that. Her hope for the planet is that the people on it respect nature more. I think that's something we can all concur with. Uh, Xanthi, would you like to ask your question? Um, how can science and innovation impact the demand for meat and dairy alternatives over the next 10 years? And is it a good thing, be it for health or planet? So I'm not claiming an enormous amount of expertise because I think the science is still emerging. But I think it is important to look across a whole range of different disciplines when you start considering all of the different factors to take into account. So I think there is um, enormous opportunities in technology to farm differently and to um, produce food differently. I'm also really concerned to balance some of the unintended consequences that might be associated with those. Um, in, a, in the Commission's report, we landed pretty squarely on the side of agroecology and regenerative agriculture, by which we mean farming in harmony with nature and recognising that livestock farming has an important part to play in building up um, soil health, in supporting um, ecosystems, grassland ecosystems. And, and also has a high contribution to, uh, to human health. And particularly in other parts of the world, livestock is central to a more equal um, food system. But we cannot carry on producing livestock as we do. Um, I'm, I'm personally um, more encouraged by um, extensive ruminant agriculture which supports farming systems um, that are uh, more distributed and, and fairer. And I'm not an enormous fan of um, livestock systems that rely on soy, for example, or grain for you know, housed poultry or housed pork. Um, in, in terms of the science of food production, um, I think this is very, very much an emerging science and has the capacity to be incredibly exciting. But I would really, really want to understand the impacts on public health of um, choosing to produce and eat food very differently to the way that we have evolved to do so. So both exciting, but I think we have to be really careful and not be seduced by the kind of tech will save us mantra that we do hear so much of. Anything to add on that one, Henry? Um, yes, I, I think it's a really, it's not only a fascinating area, it's an area where the debate is, I was saying, I'd say pretty unpleasant. A lot of people, um, with very strongly held views, not listening to each other, um, condemning the other side as being good or bad, and it's unhelpful. And I think there are a number of different ways in which you could answer your question. So at the kind of most gentle, uh, there are scientists working on how you get cows to release less methane. Can you feed them different diets? So on and so forth. At the other side of the scheme, you have George Monbiot uh, with his program this evening, predicting that farming will be extinct by 2050 because we'll be producing uh, everything in um, 
uh, with GM modified bioreactors which produce these proteins. So you have this kind of great swathe. And I think our job in that is um, not to predict winners or losers. Who knows if, uh, if the precision fermentation will come off. If it does, it will wipe out powdered milk, the powdered milk market pretty quickly, but who knows. Our job is to, is to really try and bring some light rather than heat into those arguments, to set out the characteristics of different livestock systems, the difference between um, a regenerative system and a feedstock system, and then to set out what it is where the government should be interested in being involved. So, for example, what is our position on whether we want to eat the stuff? You know, what, is, what regulatory environment do we need? Should government be incentivizing, de-incentivizing? So what we're trying to do at the moment is spend a lot of effort really trying to understand in more detail the elements of that debate. Thanks very much. I think in the interest of time, I might have to move on just because we're uh, running short. Um, our next question is from Hugh, and Hugh is, uh, lives on an 11-acre small holding abundant in food and wildlife situated in the foothills of the Cambrian Mountains, and at age 12, he created his own YouTube channel about organic small-scale vegetable gardening, which now has over 170,000 subscribers, and his videos have collectively been viewed over 30 million times. Um, Hugh, what question would you like to ask? Um, I mean, it's all, it's all well and good talking about this really fantastic, sustainable food world that we want to live in, but the reality is, uh, is that sustainable food production is just a very small percentage still in the UK, and I don't think enough has been addressed to do that. And it's not easy to change minds of old conventional farmers. They're really um, set in their ways, and you understand why, because the subsidies have meant that they haven't been incentivized to look at other things. And, and I also feared that something else which is quite traditional, um, and too traditional perhaps to shift um, direction, uh, some agricultural colleges. So what I fear is not enough is being done to educate the next generation of farmers with regenerative um, techniques, etc. So what can be done to support um, the next wave um, of new entrant farmers so it can become mainstream? Is it teaching a, a whole new, almost flock, uh, no pun intended, of, of, of trainers? Or is it creating new colleges which actually put that as a mainstream and not seen as this little side thing which we have to cover to tick a box? Sure. Two, would you like to kick us off? Thank you, Hugh, and I'm going to look out for your YouTube channel. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to just pick up a little bit, too, on the, um, on, on the, the comments that you're making in your preamble, really, and, and it almost follows up on what Henry was saying, too. You, you can't look at any of these issues through one lens. You can't just look through the carbon lens. You can't just look through the biodiversity lens. You, you also have to look through the economic lens, the social justice lens, and where you live in Wales and where I live in Wales, Agriculture is really essential to the culture of our communities. It's where our language resides, and it's, it, it's just deeply embedded in how we live our lives. And all of those considerations have to be held together, so we can't just weigh up one set of considerations. Um, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than you um, about the appetite for young people to come into farming and growing, and their enthusiasm to look into different ways of going about their work. I have just been spending some time over in the um, other farming conference up the road. Um, we ran a session yesterday on combating um, polarization in the food and farming sector. And the room was full of young farmers who are really keen to, um, to, to explore very different ways of working and operating. But we have to create the right environment, the right economic, the right social, the right educative environment to enable that to happen. And in a way, those are questions outside of DEFRA, they're in industrial strategy. So you know, we, it, it's absolutely critical that we, um, we, we consider all of the interconnections. I think in Wales, we don't do too badly. We, have, we still have government-funded education and development. And I'm a you know, huge fan of Farming Connect. I go along quite often, send my husband along, and they, they will 
put on the sorts of programs that farmers, that a whole swathe of different kinds of farmers want. And it's a really good way for government to direct investment in the sorts of new knowledges that they know that farmers need it. So just recently we've been looking at grassland management, about biodiversity, about changing livestock management, working with ruminants. So um, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic but also mindful that we need to be campaigning across a whole range of fronts, not just in DEFRA or in, in the devolved nations in those government departments, but across economic, social justice, welfare, employment and trade and so on. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly. You might want to come back to that. Sure, yeah. I'm really glad that you asked that question. Interestingly, a couple of minutes before we, uh, we started this, this session, uh, Charlie, who was on the last panel, and I were having a conversation about, um, we, we went to our local agricultural college in Lancashire um, at the beginning of the year to talk to them about some ideas that we had for courses. And um, they were very interested in talking to us, but then uh, showed us all the kind of high tech stuff and, the, and, the, and, the, and all the work that they're doing around increasing yield and, and really didn't really get what we were talking about. So we just made a plan there uh, before this session to go back and have that conversation. So I think, um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a good I think um, there's still very much this idea that you have to have lots of land, even if you're doing these sustainable things, um, to make it profitable. But there's a lot of different... Uh, farms which are approving otherwise and how important diversity is. So I, I guess it's more being able to facilitate the translation of all of these ideas and, and make it really easy for them to understand um, and kind of just put that infrastructure there in the colleges and, and work closely because, and a lot of people my age in, in my area, I, I'm, I'm hearing what they're learning and it's still very much traditional and set in the ways and they're going to be getting their dad's farms in the next couple of years and there's not going to be much change. I just feel there needs to be more energy um, and support behind that. Great, thanks. Okay, so moving on we have Maria. Maria has a first class uh, bachelor's in biochemistry from the University Automata Autonoma of Madrid uh, and in nutrition, physical activity, and public health from the University of Bristol. She uh, currently is a field worker engaged in public health interventions for Bristol Medical School and the School of Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. Maria, what is your question? Yeah, so my question is, um, how good an integrate national food strategy ensure better public health outcomes, considering an increasing obesity epidemic and related lifestyle diseases such as high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, that are crippling the NHS and affecting life expectancy of children and young people. Thanks, Maria. Um, Angela, do you think you could touch on that? Thank you. So I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I've spent my life working in the NHS. My specialism is public health. And in about 2006, I got involved in the transition movement. I became very frustrated in my health job, where I was only allowed to talk about the nutritional content of some processed gunk, which had been produced completely unethically and in a way that trashed the place. And so I had to jump ship and go and work with my sustainability colleagues. And I helped do the Who Feeds Bristol report and all kinds of stuff there. What strikes me is growing up working in the NHS. The NHS was prototyped in a town in Wales when there was profound economic depression. And everyone in the town said, what if we pooled some money and every time any of us is sick, their healthcare comes out of that pool of money? And after the Second World War, Nye Bevan took that plan and introduced it nationally. And people said the Luftwaffe did in weeks what no amount of campaigning had managed to do in years. It won everybody's mindset over to health should be for everybody. Direct to consumer advertising of any health related project, pro product is illegal. 
so there isn't that huge invisible troll brainwashing everybody into the fact that they might need cosmetic surgery or they might need this pill that doesn't work and nobody's evaluated it. It doesn't mean that everything has to be provided by the state, but is commissioned and it is available free at point of service to everybody. I cannot understand why in such a time of crisis we are not taking the same view on food. Everybody needs good, healthy, nutritious food and it must be produced with social justice in mind and with care of the natural world in mind. It is not beyond our imagination, our intelligence and our wit to do that. This, I spent a long time in the tobacco sphere and within four years of the first evidence that the lung cancer epidemic was caused by cigarette smoking, the tobacco industries had secretly all clubbed together, created the Tobacco Industry Research Council and took control of the agenda. Um, Big Food did the same, kicked off in 1977 by the first American committee which said the food industry is making people really, really sick. They went into overdrive, they've divided and ruled us, they've undermined and sneered at any well-meaning actions. They should not be allowed to do that. It should be called out, it should be exposed. And so much of the discourse, even in this conversation, has been about consumers, as though it's up to consumers. If war was declared tomorrow, the government would not say, we'll just have to wait and see if consumers want to join the army. We'll just have to wait and see if consumers want to fund the arms trade. I'm a pacifist, so I don't like using that analogy. But we are in a crisis. And we're not consumers, we're citizens. And we behave as though money is a real thing, we invented it. It's our imaginary friend that we blame for everything. We behave as though the multinational corporations are the only things that matter. They aren't. We need a total mindset shift. Thanks very much. Maria, did you want to return on that point? What the National Food Strategy plans to make for this issue? Henry, very briefly, any input on what the National Food Strategy... To improve health. Yeah, yes. I think, how, so it linked both the questions. So um, I think the health actually is a much, much harder problem to solve than the environmental one, simply because we currently spend three billion pounds as Guy said earlier on, uh, paying people to own land. And if uh, the environmental land management policy, which replaces that, is done properly, it will pay people to, um, to deliver public goods to improve the environment. And that is going to be a massive, massive change. As Guy said, and I think he's right to be a little sceptical, there are a million ways in which that could end up looking like the system today. But if it is done right, that will be transformative. I think that the health issue, I mean, it's interesting, we did have, after the war, we had public restaurants. The state ran restaurants um, uh, providing good, cheap, affordable food. I think the issue that we have now with the food system is we are, it is framed, A, in, in a frame of consumers, B, in a frame of personal responsibility. So when you talk to anyone, you go talk to anyone about rich or poor in Grimsby or in central London and the first thing they talk about is it's our fault, it's you know, it's, I should be doing this, I should be doing that and then we as a country have quite a strong reaction generally about the state getting involved in our private life helping us to eat a diet and I think, I was talking about this earlier, the combination of the genetics that makes us really want to eat that stuff and the economics that makes that stuff um, uh, both cheap and easy to sell is powerful and very harmful. I don't think it's evil, I think it's kind of, it's just this confluence of things makes it very difficult to work out how to untie it. And we're spending, I, I don't know, I don't know how you undo this. I, mean, I, I didn't quite understand what you were recommending in terms of get the state getting involved, but I think it is a really, really difficult, difficult problem. And if we don't solve it, 
it will overrun the NHS. So we have to solve it. But I don't know. We're at the start of the process, and I don't know. If you have any practical, specific ideas, I would absolutely love to hear them. You could b begin by making it illegal to advertise food and drink products. Okay, thanks very much. We're going to have to move on now. Um, next up, we have Sam. Uh, Sam, after a radical stint as an environment prefect at school, Sam went to study physical geography at Durham U University, and upon graduating, she received an Experiencing China scholarship, where she specialised in the environment and returned to start a placement at Nottingham City Council, coordinating their sustainability plan. Sam, what's your question? Uh, so this, is this working? Oh, yeah. the, uh, this uh, kind of follows on nicely, um, kind of concerning the debate around where, where the responsibility lies. Like, is it the consumer or is it through policy? Um, so arguably, um, transformative change will require education of the masses um, on the importance of a just, localised, and resilient food system. Um, how do we go about achieving this, um, and how can policy support this? I think that's to Anna. No pressure. <laughs> so I hear two things. One, can you hear me? Um, one is about where does the responsibility lie, and then where is the power for systemic change? Um, the way a system works, um, and the way we tend to look at it, we took it like, as, a, as a whole, we tend to look at it. Um, and that system affects individual behaviours within that system. So us as individuals, whether we're citizens, whether we are individuals within organisations, whether we're working within a government. Um, and and our, the actions that we create within that system then feed back into the broader system and continuously change it, continuously shape it. A system is not an end state, it's a continuous process of change. So that means that every person in this world has power to change the system. In fact, we are shaping the system right now. Um, what is tricky then becomes, how can it be intentional? How do you know um, that what you're doing is actually pushing the system in the direction that you want? Um, and that comes to not just education. Education has a piece uh, to play, it is very important, but education without empowerment uh, doesn't really lead to the kind of change that we want to see. So something that I, I've tried to promote a lot is this, this um, challenge to the word consumer and to the idea of us uh, and our role in society as consumers and offering an alternative, which is open for discussion, uh, which we call citizen. Um, if, as a consumer, we consume knowledge, uh, but we feel very disempowered, and if, even if we know something and we feel there's nothing we can do about it, what is our first response? Our response is like either, well, actually, it's his fault, it's not mine, or throwing in the towel, I don't want to deal with this, or I can't deal with it. It's much easier for us, although, you know, we, we, we're looking at mental health um, rise, like mental health issues rising a lot. I think, especially our younger generations, we're feeling quite desperate to the situation that we're facing because we feel very disempowered, even though we know so much about what's going on. Um, so empowering is incredibly important as well and the, by treating people as citizens or by reminding ourselves that we are citizens even in cases where we are treated as consumers, which as a dominant narrative at the moment is what the message is, is telling us. Just you know, listen to the information, choose between options and keep quiet. Um, instead of actually I have the power to um, bring in my own ideas, I can challenge and say hey actually I want to be on that table as well and I want to be able to bring my ideas in. which you're actually doing here today, which is nice to see. Um, I'm losing track. Am I actually answering the question, or do you want <laughs> to come in with a comment? Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I suppose in that case, how can a, a food strategy empower the people in order to yeah, affect change? Well, I have to say I'm quite encouraged with uh, citizens' assemblies being mentioned as part of the national food strategy process. Um, the way that I would like to see um, citizens involved in the process, it's not simply solving the problems that people in government can't solve, <laughs> but bringing in our own experience. So it's something again with systems change. It is the process of understanding how to intervene is complex, but the solutions can be fairly simple. Um, the way that you need to understand systems, there's two ways to look at systems. One is doing an analysis of it, which we do a lot, so looking at the broader picture and, and actually the challenge that we have probably, that you're facing probably is try to understand the whole picture. Um, that has its role and is very important. Then there's a second question, so what, how do we intervene? In order to intervene, we need to understand the specific points in the system 
um, and view that, the system from their point of view. So as a farmer, how does all of that look from my point of view? As, as a citizen, um, how does that look from my point of view? As, as a politician, how does that look from my point of view? And develop strategies at that level. That's what I would hope to see. And therefore, when we bring in citizens within those conversations, is to understand what, how does that look like for them? And how can we help them shape the system through their, their sphere of power? Thank you. Cheers. Okay, very briefly, and then we'll have to... Just very <coughs> quickly, I think there's a lot of confusion out there about what constitutes a healthy and sustainable diet. And I think what we do need to try and do is, is um, make funding available to bring in experts, community nutritionists and dietitians that we used to have, that we no longer have, um, to, to, to deliver those healthy and sustainable food messages to people that don't get access to that, even in schools now. Um, that, that those messages aren't, aren't really clear and consistent, so thank you. Okay. Right, and uh, last but not least, um, I think Maria is going to ask our last question for us. Yeah, so my second question is, how can the influence of the big food lobby be contrary to meet the interests of citizens rather than greed and profit? Okay. Could you say that again? I don't, yeah. yeah, sorry. How can the influence of the big food lobby be contrary to meet the interests of citizens rather than greed and profit for themselves? Could you just explain a little bit? The big food lobby? Yeah. So how... So Sorry. What? How can the influence of the big food lobby be contrary to meet the interests of citizens rather the than cap greed and profit? The interests of citizens. How do we stand up to the big food doing all NPOs? So... To benefit... Yeah, I right. think by, by conferences like this, by bringing people together and having conversations, I think we can all have conversations locally with people and raising awareness um, through events and, um, and through um, charters, constitutions, really um, creating organisations that can, like the, the LADA, just to give you a little bit of an, an idea of what we do, it was, um, we set up five years ago because um, people in, in, in Lancashire were, were concerned about certain issues, so we, all, we brought a lot of people together, had, uh, did a consultation with 300 people who we developed a charter and now we've been able to kind of have quite a big influence now over how things work. Would anybody else like to say a thing on that? So I, yes, support, support the new and encourage innovation um, for the new. But I'm, I'm going to say something that's potentially controversial in this setting. Um, having been um, you know, an activist for 30 years and now occupying you know, a, a fairly conventional um, role in life, um, I think it is really, really important that we find ways to have conversations with those people that we call the other. We hosted an event yesterday at OFC on combating polarisation. I think that's one of the most dangerous things that we are having to deal with as a society at the moment, the way, as, as Henry said earlier, we are no longer able to talk to each other more productively. I have found in my experience that in those very same big food organisations are individuals who want to do the right thing, who have come to learn different things as a result of either the science changing um, or you know, other, other new knowledges. And, and unless we are prepared to talk to those people who are not like us and don't agree with us, it is much more difficult for real substantial whole system change to happen. Because we, because they're the folk that have to change. And I think we have to make it really easy and possible as far as we can for them to do the right thing in every way possible. Thanks very much, Sue. Um, and a huge thank you to all of our speakers today. That brings us to the end of our questions. Um, we have run over. I think the, the last thought that I would like to leave you with is just around the value that I think young people have added to uh, the debate and the dialogue today and the need, as Sue was saying, to reach out and um, converse with each other across those divides, whether it be geography or age or whatever, and to really recognize the valuable resource and the energy and potential that we have in young people so I would urge you all to go away back to your organizations and think about what you are doing to not only tackle these issues yourselves but to also make young people your allies in solving this thank you all for coming sorry we overran I hope you found it interesting